Welcome to another episode of 254 Youth Policy Cafe, where we facilitate conversations on youth engagement in public policy. Um, today, I'm joined by very interesting guests, and I'm super excited about these shoots. Um, so I think I'll let my panel introduce themselves, starting from Stella coming my way. <laughs> Thank you, Samantha. So I'm um, Stella, a member of 254 Youth Policy Cafe. Uh, Cliff Ortega, um, a Nairobi businessman and politician. Everybody has very brief introductions. Okay. Uh, my <laughs> name is take your Susan time as much Silentui. as possible. <laughs> um, well, I am a public policy analyst by profession. Um, I also run a podcast called and YouTube channel called Is That So with Silentoy, uh, where we discuss, uh, we break down complex policy issues, um, mainly civic education. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, that's it. <laughs> I think Cliff wants to say a bit more. Do you want to say a bit more as well? If you want me yeah, to. Yeah, please go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, my day job is um, I run a Nairobi consulting firm. Um, we consult and train and advise on uh, in various industries, mainly around uh, strategy, corporate governance, risk management, and, uh, and corporate finance. Um, my passion, though, um, is politics and how we use politics to organize our societies. And hopefully we'll talk about that today. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited about this shoot, especially because we are obviously drawing um, closer and closer to an election year. So it's mm -hmm. so important that we start to think through what exactly youth participation looks like. And um, when I think about youth participation, I'm obviously thinking about them being involved in the planning process. <laughs> Um, all the way through to identifying needs, um, whether it's at election, um, whether it's with IEBC or whether it's with just the electioneering process at large, mm -hmm. um, finding solutions, being involved in the decisions, and just like having them involved throughout the process. Um, so um, I reviewed some of the statistics from the last election we had in 2017. And for me, um, considering we're looking at a population where young people account for, um, <coughs> or rather below 35 uh, people aged below 35 account for almost 75% of the population. And we, when you think about the category of people aged um, between um, 15 and 35, it's about 36% of the population. And yet in the last election, um, only about 9% um, of them who vied um, went into politics, only about 16% of those who are elected um, were young people. And it's even a more worrying statistics when you oh, statistic when you try and break it down into gender. And Silanto, I know you ran, but among the young people who ran, 94% were men. And I feel like those are very devastating statistics, in my opinion. Um, yeah, so I really just want to um, jump into the conversation by um, asking you guys, and probably Stella could start us off. Mm -hmm. Um, why should we position young people to participate in politics from an international perspective? Like, why are countries aspiring to have more and more young people involved in the political process? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Samantha, for that quite good introduction about uh, youth and how the statistics are looking at when you uh, consider our last election. So um, there is international frameworks that uh, cultivate or motivate for more inclusion of youths uh, in the political process, in the electoral process. We have uh, current the Agenda 2030 that has 17 uh, sustainable goals. And part of the goals uh, really advocate for uh, entirely the goals advocate for inclusive uh, societies, leaving no one behind, youth and women represented in our different aspects of the societies, including our uh, election. We have SDG4 that talks about civic education for um, on how youths can participate in election, SDG5 on gender equality, there's SDG on reduced uh, inequalities in the society, and specifically there's SDG16 that talks about uh, just uh, societies, uh, just institutions. So from an international uh, perspective, there are frameworks that are trying to motivate and push for more youth inclusion. And even when you come down to Africa within our continent, we have Agenda 2063 that uh, talks about the Africa we want. And part of the Africa we want is uh, good governance. Part of the Africa we want is uh, human rights. It's inclusion of uh, everyone in the society, um, making sure that we have institutions that are allowing for more women 
for more youth uh, to be represented uh, in this uh, institution. So I don't want yeah. to go deeper <laughs> yeah. into the international yeah. frameworks. So I'm going to allow uh, uh, Cliff and uh, Silantoy to bring us home in terms of the electoral process in Kenya. Yeah. Um, I think something that we can all speak to, and especially in the last five years and with COVID, um, we've seen the impact of not having young people in politics. Um, we've seen even the impact of COVID when you look at the health-related implications. Fine, we may not be dying as much as the older generation, but mm -hmm. um, parents of young people are dying. Parents of young people who are still dependent on um, other like um, elders to um, support them. When you look at the education system, a majority of the people in education, be it at tertiary level or even at secondary level, are young people. So we've seen the impacts directly affect young people, and we have seen policies not respond to these needs over the last few years. I'm very curious to know from Cliff and Silantoy, because I know you've been in this space, does the legislative or policy or governance framework within Kenya um, allow for the inclusion of young people? So you could, yeah, Cliff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think there are quite a number of laws that actually um, have provisions for young people to participate in these processes. Um, some of them include um, when you're paying for nominations, mm -hmm. I mean, for to be able to buy at IABC, young people actually get it at half price. So if you're going to pay like, 30,000 to, I'm not very sure if it's 30, to, to buy for Senate, mm -hmm. a young person will probably pay 15. Mm -hmm. I think it's 50 and then you pay 25. Mm -hmm. um, so so those are some of the things that they, they try to encourage you um, so that you don't pay as much maybe, so, you know, just mm -hmm. to access the spaces bit better. Um, I don't think there's enough um, laws within political parties mm -hmm. to have more young people participate within that space. Um, a lot of people who participate in, young people who participate in political parties would probably participate through the youth leagues um, within these different parties. Those are also not extremely regulated. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, if anything, a lot of people would say they're done um, as a token kind yeah. of thing. Like, okay, mm -hmm. yeah, we have this Kassandi school for young people, right <laughs> over there. Um, so there's that as well. Um, and I think more can be done, really, because in mm -hmm. other spaces, like, for example, in countries like South Africa, mm -hmm. they have a quarter for women mm -hmm. uh, within political parties. And these parties are incentivized by government to have more women. And the more women you have within your parties, the more women who are fielded um, to vie during elections, the more your party actually gets funding from government. So mm -hmm. if government really wanted young people to participate, there are the various methods that they could use. I think they have just not been proactive in doing this. But then again, just to say, even with these kinds of frameworks available, um, at the end of the day, politics has always been run by the older people mm -hmm. um, because politics is very money-driven mm -hmm. and young people are, don't really have the money. And so in as much as you can have all these frameworks put in place, for as long as there's no political goodwill from the people who are within the spaces and, and there's no political goodwill from young people themselves mm -hmm. to participate in this space, mm -hmm. then not much will happen, regardless of what kind of remarks we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Cliff, please comment. Okay, so um, I, I don't know of any specific, mm -hmm. um, well-thought-out uh, framework for youth participation in politics or any other form of governance, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. um, in Kenya. There's bits and pieces everywhere, mm -hmm. but I think it's mainly um, a principle, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And then the way um, that it's uh, best manifested is through party manifestos. Mm -hmm. But our whole structure, and we have to go back to even, you know, the history of our politics, mm -hmm. it has evolved as, you know, a transactional mm -hmm. democracy. Mm -hmm. You know, that's something. I don't know if that's a thing. If it's not, I've just come up with it now. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, for example, and I think we might talk about this in more detail later, you see the IBC published some regulations recently about mm -hmm. campaign finance. Mm -hmm. Those are astronomical figures for mm -hmm. the average Kenyan. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the average Kenyan, as you've said, mm -hmm. is a young person, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. um, who is actually just struggling to put food on the table, yeah. either for themselves or, you know, as, as somebody's child or for their own um, young families, you know. So... That is something that is um, is is a structural deficiency mm -hmm. in our governance structure, yeah. and uh, the challenge there is that because it suits the people who um, are in office, mm -hmm. then that is something that we perpetuated. Now, what are the perhaps the easy wins? Mm -hmm. 
um, I was thinking earlier, and we we're talking earlier, that mm -hmm. um, the, the challenge with legislating for every change and for in, in inclusivity at every level is that you end up with fragmentation, mm -hmm. and it can become ridiculous because how low do you go? Mm -hmm. But there are some easy wins. Mm -hmm. One of the things that um, I'm really keen to see in our politics is term limits. Mm -hmm. That's how we get people out. Okay, mm -hmm. if you mm -hmm. can't do something over two terms of say ten years, mm -hmm. I don't see you doing it in fifteen. Mm -hmm. We've done it at presidential level. I think we need to devolve that down. Mm -hmm. In fact, we mm -hmm. could even have it as one limit because politics should not be an income generating activity True. for anybody. Mm -hmm. Okay, it should be something that is driven by passion and your contribution. Mm -hmm. So. So rather than perhaps focus too much on the theory, I think um, young people need to push for actionable things mm. that are bite-sized and can be implemented quickly so that mm. um, if there's any pushback, that's easier to negotiate, you know, and, and agitate for. Yeah. And I'm just curious, and this is, um, I know something that, yeah, it's, it's just something random that has popped into my mind um, as you are speaking. I feel like there's all these... Um, organizations or institutions that are mandated to support um, young people. Mm -hmm. um, and even recently when we were talking about BBI, there was the commission that was proposed to support the needs of young people. But we have NYC National Youth Council there. Mm -hmm. So in this space of elections, what do you think their role is? And this is just like a random question because there are organizations that um, we are paying civil servants for. We are, um, we are paying civil servants at the Ministry of Youth. Um, is it that when it comes to elections, they should go silent and they then don't have a role? Some of those institutions, what do you think their role is? I can comment. Um, so the role of an institution like the National Youth Council, uh, the Ministry of Young, the, the Ministry of Youth and mm -hmm. whatever, the Department of Youth, mm -hmm. um, and even within each county, there's actually a section that is dedicated to young people. Mm -hmm. um, I think usually what happens when it comes to uh, election seasons and all that, um, most of these departments are very politicized mm -hmm. uh, and they would end up supporting probably the incumbent or whoever is in power at the time because they are government mm -hmm. um, and, you know, job security and mm -hmm. things like those mm -hmm. are at stake at all times. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially when it comes to election period. Mm -hmm. um, but ideally, in an ideal world, mm -hmm. because I, I do, we yeah. don't live in an ideal world. <laughs> but in an ideal world, I think the main responsibility that they should be taking on is actually, first of all, civic education. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of young people don't know how to engage, mm -hmm. don't know where and, you know, how mm -hmm. to start. Mm -hmm. um, even just basic things like where do you go and vote and all mm -hmm. that. You know, I know IBC is mainly responsible for voter education. Mm -hmm. But if they're really interested in having young people participate mm -hmm. in these things, then they should really partner with IABC in these spaces to be able to do that. Secondly, um, they usually give, the NYC's main mandate is actually to almost have an umbrella body for mm -hmm. youth organizations, mm -hmm. including 254 Cafe, by the way, Policy mm -hmm. Cafe. <laughs> so they should be able to have an umbrella thing like KOTU, for mm -hmm. example, that mm -hmm. actually speaks as one voice for young people. Mm -hmm. But they've not been able to achieve that just because of the politicization of that space. And so... It, those are some of the things that they could do. So you have youth organizations. They could they could lobby for tax cuts. They could mm -hmm. lobby for um, grace periods for specific things. Mm -hmm. That's the role that, that that organization needs to play. And also educating those young people about their role as well. So mm -hmm. I think it's a it's a it's an it's a case of politicization, um, and a, a seriously untapped resource that could be used there. Yeah. Yeah. Cliff. Okay. Um, the more we talk about this, the more I think um, we are looking for something revolutionary, not mm -hmm. evolution, because mm -hmm. I don't see um, an easy way to break the entrenched um, uh, political class barrier. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because um, because we we've unfortunately made politics one of the perhaps fastest, if not, but as well the dirtiest way to wealth, okay, in people's eyes, then I don't see how that can be broken. But um, I still get a lot of satisfaction from seeing, like in Zambia recently, the, the youth vote actually, you know, re ejected a sitting president from office, and they perhaps did not necessarily have to have a framework or a way of doing things that mm -hmm. was different from what existed. Mm -hmm. It was just a groundswell. And you know, now one of the easy things um, that you can use is like social media mm -hmm. and that sort of thing to mm -hmm. organize. Mm -hmm. So maybe the change that we are looking for um, will necessarily not come from the people who are in power now mm -hmm. because the status quo mm -hmm. serves them. 
then um, people need to be more revolutionary and try and build this from, and I'm going to use this phrase, unfortunately, from the bottom <laughs> up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to bring the change that yeah. we want to see. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And perhaps that, that's, that's maybe the only way, given the time we have mm -hmm. before the next election. Yeah. And um, Stella, anything on that? Institutions well, and... In fact, like you can, yeah. <laughs> so I feel without going to the civic education, because of course that is really uh, very fundamental, mm -hmm. there are also those institutions that need to create a very conducive environment uh, for the youths to participate in the electoral uh, process. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to preempt uh, the questions for the next conversation, but I just uh, feel like having a peaceful environment cultivated by the Ministry of Interior that helps the youths to be safe. Mm. as they participate in the electoral process. That is like one of the fundamental functions like different institutions can do. Yeah. Government. Yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. I like what you've said because participation, I think, goes beyond um, understanding what people are bringing to the table. It goes beyond um, actually voting on that day. Protesting is part of um, participation and we just need to create an all-round um, conducive environment for that. And um, I like that you said it goes beyond the youth organizations. There are so many other... Um, groups that should be involved. Um, but I think we've been seeing more and more on social media. I like that, Cliff, you've mentioned social media as a source of revolutions. Um, that young people are saying more and more, Fagia Wate. Um, Fagia Wate, Fagia Wate. I, I watched a clip, I think, by Eric Omo. I hope they remember in, <laughs> during the actual election. I hope they remember. <laughs> but yeah, there's been that conversation on Fagia, uh, Fagia Wate. But we already know there are also existing barriers. So I personally believe in intergenerational um, politics because we don't have the right to rule over like guys who are 40 and above and they don't have the right to rule over us either. There needs to be like conversations had like both directions. But I feel like for young people, there, are co there have constantly been barriers to not just their participation in politics, uh, but also just generally even just understanding the content because um, things like manifestos are not packaged to their needs or in ways that they can resonate with. So um, I'd be interested in understanding from you guys. Um, I know Cliff and Solanto, you've um, participated in the political process. Um, what hindrances there are existing to participation, either like in running for various seats. I know you've run for senator, you're running for MCA, um, and just generally barriers to participation in the political process at large um, for young people. Okay, I'll, I'll go first. So I, uh, from my perspective, um, if I think about it, and I try to break it down to just four things, politics in Kenya is a blend of money, um, strategy, spin, and unfortunately violence, okay? And that violence, of course, impacts. It's um, youth that are used to perpetuate violence, but I think they're also the biggest victims, okay? And then, of course, if you're a woman candidate or voter, or you're just caught up in the melee, then obviously you suffer, you know, uh, more than say the average man. So one of the big barriers, like I was saying, um, is uh, campaign finance. Mm -hmm. Now, IBC sets a ceiling, which we believe then is representative of what people think, and uh, the lowest ceiling is three million for MCA. Now, if you're a young person, it doesn't matter who you are in Kenya, but if you're particularly <laughs> a young person, I mean, that could be, if the average, um, if the GDP per capita in Kenya is I think a thousand plus dollars, then how many years of income is that, you know? Mm. Yeah, so it's, it, that's just ridiculous. And we need to change the conversation from money to, um, you know, um, strategy. And Kiswaili said as a woman, you know, public mm. policy and what you want to do. Um, number two, spin. Mm. A lot of politics is about spin. It's about mm. sloganeering. And that's, it's not unique to Kenya. But here, I think we've just made it a dark art mm. because you have the best ideas, but just a little bit of spin, somebody takes a photo of you, spins it around, Photoshop <laughs> is accepted here as evidence, you know, and then that sort of thing, bloggers and all that stuff. Uh, the, the, the thing that should be most important perhaps is strategy, mm -hmm. but it's the thing that people pay the least attention to, okay? Mm -hmm. And then um, underlying all that is we have an economic crisis, and I think we've had one for a long time, okay? That's maybe a topic for another day, but people that can't see beyond putting food on the table today, mm -hmm. okay, before, I mean, beyond getting an education, 
um, beyond the ability to maybe run a business or get a good job, mm -hmm. it's very unlikely that you'll reach them mm. with, you know, medium long to long-term strategy. strategies. Mm. Yeah. So I think those for me would be the three, four key challenges. Mm -hmm. um, I won't add on what you talked about mm -hmm. with the campaign financing and all that. Um, those are also like difficulties that I faced when I was running. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody else has a lot more money than you. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that that's a difficult thing. Um, the other thing, and that I think we had talked about maybe offline before is the issue of political parties. So um, even people who are trying to buy in the next election, you don't even know which party will be there on the day of elections. You know, so it's like it's it's like a an evade, like it's a it's like a game that like you just don't know how to win at. Mm -hmm. um, but even within the political parties that exist, like there's a lot of bureaucracy, there's a lot of paycheck, especially for women. Mm -hmm. um, maneuvering those spaces within political parties is very difficult. And we know that political parties are the main channel through which people are elected. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are a few people who vie as independents and get to be elected, but the vast majority are done through political parties. So I think the, the main rot in trying to achieve any sort of representation for young people is within the political parties. Mm -hmm. um, the, the nominations are always, almost always not done properly, especially in the big political parties. And we still, Kenyans still vote along those party lines. So it's very difficult for someone to break that barrier um, to be able to just be elected. So yeah, political parties is a big, big deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think something that we were trying to look at before this um, was the Political Parties Act and what it says about youth um, participation. And I think there are like two clauses on youth engagement mm -hmm. and both are very vague and put limited structure to what their participation in the pol political party itself looks like. Um, yeah, and Stella, I think you could actually speak to what that has manifested in because I think that underrepresentation of young people, political party dynamics and all that has reflected in certain um, policies and things that are actually either being picked up or not being picked up. So, yeah, maybe you could say something about that. So, uh, but also to add to the mm -hmm. earlier conversation, uh, I think the integrity, the mm -hmm. integrity, the accountability of the electoral process, el the electoral process in Kenya is mm -hmm. just wanting. Mm -hmm. And I'll just uh, come back to the recent uh, policy issue that we had, which mm -hmm. is the BBI. And if you remember, there were conversations around people being bribed to support uh, BBI. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I'm always passionate about is talking about the Higher Education Loans Board. Mm -hmm. um, it was one of the issues um, that was uh, in the BBI, and people voted for it. But in the course of this week, MPs in Parliament actually rejected a bill Mm. towards uh, reducing the interest rates, uh, towards increasing um, towards increasing the grace period for repayment of these uh, loans. So you then ask yourself, these are the same MPs that actually supported uh, BBI, and one of the mm -hmm. things it actually wanted to achieve was, uh, was the Help Act um, amendment. But now we come in Parliament and we are actually rejecting what you had initially supported. So I think the whole integrity that comes with politics, I, as Stella, if I want to buy, I need to ask myself, am I ready to compromise, to compromise. on my integrity mm -hmm. uh, just because I have to uh, align on um, political parties because people vote uh, depending on which political parties. And you've seen it in Senate. There was a bill around uh, one, one month one shilling, mm -hmm. where you'd see people actually voting uh, for that, not because they want, but it's because it's a political party position, position that you have to push. So we end up having policies that are not really pro pro youth, pro women, pro inclusiveness because of political party positions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think that's all of those issues are so valid and I think it just saddens me to see things that go through Parliament um, really these days because um, the logic behind them, especially when you look at them from the perspective of the Mwananchi, like there's just such a disconnect between the people who we have in positions of leadership and um, the common man. Um, so just on to my last question before we get um, your parting shots is there's been this constant criticism that young people go in and mess up. And that's why people are not voting for young people or why the older people want to hold those positions because we seem to be going in and either not doing as much or we are messing up. So I don't know whether you could comment on that. Is it that 
we are voting for the wrong young people. I'm not so sure what exactly is happening with that situation. I'm good to start. Um, you know, sometimes, and I'm not defending these young people who are <laughs> probably doing really bad things, but there's there's such a focus. I mean, the young people are judged a lot more harshly mm-hmm. because if you compare the number of older people who are who are messing <laughs> who up, doing the exact same <laughs> thing um, to these young people, mm-hmm. like they're not given as much criticism, as much attention as these young people who get there. So sometimes I think that the the judgment can be a little bit harsh, and I agree. However, um, I think we've we've um, we've gotten to a place where. What, what matters to young people? What matters to electorate, to the electorate, the the young mm. electorate? Um, and I think we've overglorified wealth. And mm. so when we're looking at wealth and who is wealthy and whatever, then we end up choosing, I think this person should be the MP or something, um, regardless of how they got this wealth. Um, and therefore, because of this criteria, it ends up having, you know, we have specific people who get into these offices who maybe may not have the best um, intentions mm-hmm. or also even just the best qualifications. The yeah. only qualification they probably had was the wealth <laughs> thing that we've talked about as a barrier. So mm-hmm. those guys overcame that barrier mm-hmm. and they're the only ones who are able to get there. And then therefore, the rest of the young people are judged based on this, ma- this person's actions. So, so yes, they're judged harshly, but that also because of that whole wealth thing, we end up getting a certain type of young person. Um, and it's like this because, honestly, campaigning is so difficult. You need money to campaign. And people think money for campaign is just for handouts. No, it's transport. Like, just to get around Nairobi uh, is, is money. You probably need money for, for airtime, just to call people who are coordinating things for you. There are these things we call agents <laughs> on, <laughs> on election day. And literally having an agent in one polling station costs you money. So what about the 4,000 polling stations that are the seven I don't know there are seven thousand polling stations in the country you know stuff like that you you are we are really not able to afford that and therefore we end up getting people who can afford who maybe got their money in a in a weird way um, so so let's give I think we should give grace to first of all the people who get there first but then secondly maybe relook at what we look for when we are voting mm-hmm. um, and understand so what do what do I want and what would be beneficial for me as a young person if when I'm choosing someone to vote for mm-hmm. um, yeah um, I agree look politicians are a mirror of the society mm-hmm. you know in a functional democracy <laughs> which Kenya barely is but <laughs> is okay so we tend to elect people I don't know if uh, uh, voting if you're thinking about a candidate uh, obviously it's a mix of emotion uh, and mm-hmm. reason so you're looking at somebody who perhaps best reflects your own aspirations and when we talk about societal ills, then those obviously will be manifested by young people because they are minority, so there's a bigger spotlight on them, you know, mm-hmm. um, in office. But um, they they are just a reflection of uh, society. And the truth mm-hmm. is, just like um, the other people that we see that are not politicians, you know, private individuals that do dodgy things but are still celebrated, this is no different. And so the answer, I think, doesn't lie in the people that are in office. It lies in the society that elects them. Mm-hmm. Stella? I'm, I'm just seated here. <laughs> yes, we, we are saying that uh, youth uh, sort of go into uh, electoral, uh, they, they go into parliament and they misbehave. But then I'm also thinking about the data and the evidence. It could be that, yeah, in National Assembly, that might become quite clear that we are not really seeing a lot of uh, powerful or a lot of influence that is coming from um, the uh, members of parliament uh, at national level. But I want to challenge us at mm-hmm. Youth uh, 254 Youth Policy Cafe to dig deeper into the statistics and look at what is happening at the counties and get to see uh, uh, also the youth who are in the county governments mm-hmm. really bringing out some change at county government level. Because we could be here talking a lot about what you see in the in mainstream media, but there is also at county level. We need to be able to understand are youth actually contributing to change at mm-hmm. uh, county levels? Because I imagine at county level, that's where we have a lot of uh, youth compared to uh, yeah. at national level. Mm. Yeah. 
<sighs> this has been such a nice conversation. I almost don't want to end it there, but um, I'd like to end this first part there because I know we'll definitely go into another conversation about IEBC preparedness and what we need to look out for in manifestos. But um, before we go there, I'd really love to get your parting shots on this first part. Um, include within your part is, uh, parting shot what you think the way forward. Um, you've mentioned a lot of barriers. So, like, what's the way forward? Should we be hopeless? Like, should we just accept that the situation is what it is and it is what it is? Or, like, yeah, I mean, what's the way forward? Uh, yeah, go first. <laughs> okay, yeah, gents first. So, um, basically, I think, look, there's a lot of voter apathy from um, where I sit. As I, I've spoken to a lot of people, more mm -hmm. people than probably I would have spoken to the past 10 years of my life in the past three months. And I can sense this voter apathy. Mm -hmm. People say it and you can see it. But the thing is, I would encourage people to turn that indifference to interest, mm -hmm. you know, turn that frustration to focus and turn that anger to action. And there's no political messiah coming to save Kenya. There's no political messiah coming to save your county or your ward. The change and that savior you're looking for is already in you and it's in your elector's card. So take interest, you know, don't give up because that's what an entrenched uh, transactional political system wants. You know, if somebody only has to campaign for 5,000 votes when, you know, five years ago they needed 12,000, that's obviously mm -hmm. an easy election for that mm -hmm. person. So don't give people that opportunity. And read widely, people have access to the internet. Look at examples, like I just mentioned Zambia earlier. So take advantage. The beauty of democracy is every five years we get a chance to do it over again. So let's take that chance. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Me? Okay. I'd like to just pick up on, I like what you said about <laughs> there's no messiah coming to save you. <laughs> uh, but I'd like to pick up on the point about interest. Um, I think something that I've come to see is political information in Kenya is very, uh, how do I say this? It's very polarized. And whatever is said is automatically attached to a specific individual. And then therefore it just becomes, oh my God, we can't listen. Um, but I'd like, I just like to urge young people that yes, Politics might, and this is something that millennials see, like, oh my God, it's so toxic. <laughs> and like, oh, it's not, I don't know, whatever, stuff like that. But yeah. imagine, yes, it could be toxic, but that toxicity is spilling over into your life. Mm. So you kind of have to like wade through <laughs> this toxic waters and just find <laughs> out, you know, okay, so what exactly is being said yeah. and how does it affect me? So really taking interest, you know, small steps. Start by kind of watching the news. Mm. If you don't want to watch the news, you have Twitter that really summarizes the news for you in 140 characters. You can look at that. Um, just take interest in what is happening so that you know how you can do better, how, how we can do better or what, what our role is. Uh, because staying away doesn't change the situation. It doesn't mm -hmm. at all. So take your interest. Watch the news. Follow the news on Twitter. At least know what's happening in your country. I, I know a lot of young people who are always like, ah, I don't even know those things as if it's a cool thing. It's <laughs> not. not know, like yeah. you kind of need to know. So, so yes, I, I'm really emphasizing on that point. Take interest. Take interest. Um, and then once you take interest, you can find a way forward, literally. Uh, if you look for that information, you will find it. Um, yeah, so just take interest uh, because this is your life. <laughs> uh, and it affects you. It really affects you every day. So, take interest so uh, for me I think uh, my part in short um, is when you don't vote you're endorsing the wrong uh, leader and when you vote or when you don't vote you your vote determines how your life is going to be for the next five years uh, when you support a particular candidate is that th the candidate is the one who is going to um, uh, support or design the policies that are going to govern us for the next five years. So we have the power to decide how Kenya is going to be for the next uh, five years and sadly sometimes for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, guys, thank you so much. This has been such a fun conversation. I think for me, my parting shot is we have seen um, our un underrepresentation affect us in the last five years. Um, we saw people, um, or we saw our leaders and our parliamentarians trying to um, push changes through BBI, yet they could have done it um, even before. A lot of those things they proposed for youth inclusion were things they could have done with or without BBI. 
So I think our voice definitely needs to be heard. More and more and more of us need to participate in the political process, not just by voting, but I mean, if you have the opportunity to run for any position um, that you feel like you could influence, please do run. Um, but that said, I'd like to thank you guys for participating in this shoot. Um, before we close off, I'd really love to hear from Cliff and Suzanne where we can find them. Um, so Cliff, maybe you could tell the audience. Okay. Um, so my key platforms um, are Instagram. So I'm at Cliff Otega there. Twitter, I'm also um, at Cliff Otega. That's my handle. And on Facebook, uh, facebook.com, Otega Taweza with two A's in the middle. Thanks. Otega Ataweza. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you can find me on Twitter at Silentoy Suzanne, um, on Instagram at Silentoy.Suzanne, uh, and on Facebook as Suzanne Silentoy. Yeah. And your YouTube um, yes. channel and podcast. Our podcast and YouTube, guys. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, you can find us on anywhere you get your podcast from. Um, it's called Is That So with Silentoy. Um, and on YouTube, Is That So with Silentoy as well. And as usual, you can find us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook um, at 254 Youth Policy Cafe.